Ready? Let's go! 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 Hello there, in today's video I'm going to show you how to fly and we'll also discuss how and why fake photography is changing the world. The other day I took a little peek into the Twitter rabbit hole and discovered a tweet that was suggesting that maths is fake. Now delving a little bit deeper, it became clear that there's a growing number of people starting to believe this. The irony is that they're sharing this opinion on a device literally built with maths. These weird trends are somewhat understandable though because we're now bombarded with information almost 24 seven. Now photography has been dealing with the idea of fake for many, many years. And as we'll see a bit later, now sits on the front line of a technology that has the potential to change the world. So what makes photography fake? Does it have to be natural? Can art ever be fake? Is it a documentary? Is it fact or fiction? We'll look at answering some of those questions in a little while, but before we do, I want to create an image that many people might think is fake photography. Composite images are often considered to be fake, but I really don't think they are. They're just a different type of visual art. And in the movies, this gets celebrated all the time. Look at this scene from the latest or the most recent Avengers movie. It's shot in St. Abbs in Scotland, but it's augmented by slotting a village in down by the shoreline. As you can see here from when I was there, that village doesn't really exist, but no one is accusing that film of being fake. So let's show you how I'm going to make myself fly. Now I tried this the other day just by taking this stool and lying down on the floor. But as you can see on the image here, it worked quite well, but it just doesn't quite feel like I'm flying because there's no real elevation. So what I'm having to do, a little bit dodgy, is put the stool on the table like this to get that bit of extra height. I'm going to recruit my daughter to actually fire the camera. A little bit nervous because it moves around a bit, but let's do it. Right, this is actually pretty straightforward. We're gonna take two images and then blend them together. One with me lying on the stool and then one just of the background. It's easier if you have your camera on a tripod to then blend the images together in Photoshop. I'll show you that in a minute. I'm just using the main video light at the moment, but you can do this outside without any sort of artificial lighting whatsoever. What I'm gonna do when I lie on the stool, this will drop down in front of the stool, and then we can just remove the table and the legs of the stool in post. Right, got the camera. Ready? Let's go. Go, fire, whoa. <laughs> go. Ah. That's much harder than it looks. Oh, I'm just terribly unfit, one of the two. So the trick is, and I had Bella focus right on my face, we then locked the camera into manual focus. That's important because we don't wanna shift the focus now. And then we take a second shot of the background and we'll go and combine it. Let's go, Bells. Right, I've loaded the images in, the in Lightroom, and as you can see, they're both there, one with me in it, one without me. I've edited them both exactly the same, just copied the settings one to the other. You can see how the hoodie is covering any contact between me and the stool. So that's gonna make it much easier. Select them both, right click, and then go to edit in and open as layers in Photoshop. There we go, that's now loaded in. I'm just going to copy that layer so we can see what it looks like afterwards. And then I'm going to reduce the opacity on my layer a little bit, select the one underneath, Control or Command T, and we're gonna move the Lay other layer to line up, just using the radiator. Photoshop's helped me there and snapped it into place. Hit return or the click or the tick button up there. Well, now I'm lazy when it comes to Photoshop, so I'm not gonna bother drawing a selection with things. All I'm gonna do is create the mask, hit D or X to reset your colors. I'm on black already, as you can see here. Hit the brush, I'm on the mask, and then I'm just gonna paint out this table like that. I'm just gonna use this line here actually, because that's a nice separating line to make this really easy. Uh, let's zoom out a bit, make the brush a bit bigger, and then just go all the way along this line and paint that table out really straightforward. Then I'm just gonna zoom in on the stool, adjust the size of my brush a bit, and 
just continue to paint that out. Easy as that. And then I'm gonna finish it off just by adding a little light streak in at this window here, just to give it that extra element and that extra atmosphere. I've always loved creative composite photography like this. I'm really happy with how it turned out. I was going for that kind of sinister anti-hero type feel. I also don't think this is fake photography. It's fictional, just like CGI in the movies. Fake is a pretty negative word. And what makes something fake is when fiction or opinion is being passed off as fact. It literally means not genuine. What lies at the heart of this is not the imagery or the art itself. It's the human behavior and how we communicate what we're creating. Imagine if we went back in time by a hundred years and I leaked this image to the press claiming that I could really fly. It would hit all the front pages, it would generate a huge buzz and everyone would be desperate to see me fly. The story runs out of control and eventually they discover I've lied and before I know it, my integrity and reputation is shot to pieces and everybody's annoyed at me because I tried to deceive them. This actually happened in the early 20th century with the Cottingley Fairies. Now, the two girls involved maintained for so long that it was genuine that when they eventually admitted that the images were fake, the backlash wasn't too severe. I think if it was today in the social media climate, it would be much more aggressive. If you've been following me on Instagram this week, you will have seen that I posted a series of images that I said were fake. I created them using AI software where it's shockingly easy to swap skies around or introduce beautiful light and fog to a woodland photograph that is otherwise terrible. Now on their own, I don't think these images are fake. I think the whole fake discussion boils down to authenticity, honesty, and integrity. I don't like being misled or lied to, and I don't want to be tricked or deceived. This could be an incredibly authentic and genuine image if I was known for just creating cool digital art, but I'm not. I'm a landscape photographer and I spend half my time banging on about how beautiful nature is. So if I was to start augmenting an image, swapping a sky in and then hiding that fact from you, that would make me a fraud, particularly when I begin to profit from it. Editing is a huge part of the photography process though, and landscape photography is not a documentary. It's an interpretation of the scene in front of us by the photographer. So knowing when we've gone too far with our edits is an extremely subjective thing. And it's something that photography competitions consistently struggle with. Adjustments in color, contrast, exposure, and cropping are now widely accepted, but removing elements from an image and particularly adding them in is still seen as much more contentious. My close friend runs a virtual reality business and has spent years making the fake look real. The worlds he creates have numerous applications and he spent years messing around with shadows, light, ambient occlusion, and color balance. His view is that if you swap a whole sky, then it's no longer a photo, it's CGI. But if you just mess with color balance and tones, then it's still a photograph. Whilst I want my photography to be mostly natural, I'm no way a purist. I spend time creating water drop photography with food coloring and electronic equipment. I bracket my images and I do a lot of long exposure photography that changes the way we perceive a scene. We should all be free to explore our creativity to the fullest, including swapping skies, but our intent and the way we communicate our work matters. If you allow me to believe that the sun is setting in the northern sky or the Milky Way appears over a particular landmark and then I later find out otherwise, I'm not going to thank you for it. I want to view composite images like magic or wrestling or a science fiction movie where I suspend my disbelief and enjoy the journey I'm taken on. I suspect much of this deception is because of social media and the ever increasing need to share something extraordinary. As a landscape photographer, the joy for me comes in the journey, the hunt, and the memory of all those failed attempts when I eventually nail a banger. 
The problem is, as many of you will know, is it requires a lot of hard work and dedication. It's much easier just to take a snapshot in the middle of the day, swap in an amazing sky, and then pretend it really happened. Portrait photography is possibly a better example where touching up photographs has been commonplace for years. We now have technology where we can very easily make people look thinner, make their eyes bigger, and smoothing skin now happens by default on many phone cameras. Originally, this was driven by the marketing world that were trying to sell us this idea of perfection that is neither real nor achievable. And that's now spilled into how we present ourselves online. We hear stories about the mental health problems and anxiety that social media can cause. And surely some of this can be attributed to constantly comparing ourselves to these unrealistic presentations of people's life. You might be thinking that none of this really matters, but I do wonder how this will play out as the technology continues to develop. If you've seen the remake of The Lion King, you will know how realistic landscapes can now be made to look with CGI. I'm excited by this technology, but I'm also a little bit worried what will happen when everybody has the ability to create these images at home. When I look through my portfolio, I remember the experience of creating that image, the hard work it took, the challenges I overcame. There's something to be said for earning it. If my final image that took two days to create is just a little bit worse than the image that was created digitally from scratch in just a few minutes, then I do wonder what that means for the art of photography. Will people being creative with a camera still be appreciated? Will it have any value? Now you might think this is way off into the future, but it's not, it's happening now and it's already having an effect, particularly on stock photography and some portrait photographers. Creating great portrait photography is hard. There's loads to do. You've got to have the right camera gear. You've got to set all the lighting up. You've got to arrange logistics with the studio and the model is tough. There's also then to use the, those images commercially, the publisher will need to pay for the photos or the stock and also arrange for model release forms to be signed, which can get very frustrating. The images that you've just seen on screen are not portraits that I've taken, but I didn't need permission from a photographer and I did not need to get them to sign a model release form to show you their faces. And the reason for that is because they are not real people. These are images that have been created from scratch by artificial intelligence. If you visit the website, this person does not exist. Every time you refresh the page, it shows you a new face generated completely by AI. It's crazy. The same service is also being monetized. It's a website called Generated Photos, where you can browse the images, download them, and use them without any concern for copyright claims, distribution rights, infringement claims, or royalties. And look at the publications that this website is claiming use their service. How do you feel right now thinking about a BBC article that you read recently that may have used one of these images and allowed you to believe that it was a real person? Again, I'm not a big fan of unknowingly being deceived in this way. This could potentially change the world and photography again is right at the forefront of it. This level of realism can already be achieved with 2D, but it also gives us a sign of where we're gonna go with 3D and video. The technology to create very realistic people from scratch is very exciting, but it's also somewhat disconcerting. What will it mean when we're watching a video and we have literally no way of telling whether the person we're watching is real or not? I think it's why authenticity, honesty, and integrity is just absolutely essential for everything we create and put out into the world. I honestly don't know whether to be scared or excited, but to offer you a little bit of hope, one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that for a long time to come, the real world, nature, and the landscape are still going to captivate our imagination. When we view a photograph printed and mounted on the wall, that's still going to inspire us and have greater meaning knowing that that place is real waiting for us to visit again. We also have the stories, the human stories. Whatever the medium of the future may be, we will still be entertaining each other, communicating and telling each other stories. I'm also comforted to know that there are so many more decent, good people in the world than those who want to do us harm. And what that means is eventually the good will out.